I'm Dina. And I'm Suzanne. And thank you so much for tuning in to the Rise and Shine It's Hypno Time podcast. With Dina and Suzanne. That's us. <laughs> the purpose of this podcast is to help you along your healing journey. To become the very best version of you that you can be and to create the life of your dreams. We want to give you the tools you need to succeed through personal stories, guided meditations, hypnosis, NLP, and self-hypnosis techniques, as well as interviews with experts in a variety of healing modalities, from energy workers and spiritual healers to chiropractors, acupuncturists, holistic medicine, and much, much more. Yes, and we also want this podcast to be a place where people can come together, share stories, and be reminded that you're not alone. In fact, the healing journey is a lifelong journey, and we are just so thankful that you're choosing us to be a part of your journey and that we have you to be a part of ours as well. And with that being said, let's start the show. I'm ready when you are. (laughs) Hi, everyone. Suzanne here, and we have a wonderful, intelligent, and inspirational guest coming on the show today, Paul Langfield. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist clinical hypnotherapist, and certified addictions counselor. And today, Paul shares his wisdom with us, as well as his story, and how he turned a traumatic experience into a means of empowerment for himself and others. With that being said, and without further ado, it's time to gain some insight from our very special guest, Paul Langfield. So we're so excited to have you here today. And I guess just for our listeners, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself before we jump into it. Sure, sure. So my name is Paul Langfield, and um, I have a private practice in Loveland, Colorado. I'm actually a Colorado native. I grew up in a family of 10, so lots of kids. (laughs) And our our, uh, weekends climbing 14ers and, and uh, glacier sliding and fishing and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then my, in, my, in my professional world, I, like a lot of people, I didn't have a, a straight path. Um, I started out actually um, in electrical engineering was my, my declared major originally, and then I ended up in psychology and human development, and then um, got my marriage and family therapy license in 1994. Awesome. And uh, so I was in private practice. Uh, I, you know, I think about the, the amount of um, just energy that you have when you're younger. I was, I was in private <laughs> practice when I was 24 years old. And at that same time, I was on the faculty at CSU and I was working at an inpatient drug and alcohol treatment center. Wow. And I was actually working on a PhD. And I, I looked at that now and I'm like, oh, I can do like I could maybe do one of those. Yeah. When did you sleep? <laughs> right, right. Right. I guess I just didn't need to sleep that much. <laughs> well, uh, none of so, us do at that age. <laughs> right? yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So um, I just, I fell in love with um, human development and, and um, then kind of with the whole therapy, psychotherapy aspect of things. And I actually, before I graduated from um, uh, graduate school, I had already gotten my hypnosis, my hypnotherapy an NLP certification. Wow. And, Who did you uh, get your certification through, Paul? Um, well, this is, that's a good question. It's funny, <laughs> this will age me, but I actually was trained by um, Connie Ray and Steve Andreas. Oh, really? So, yeah, we were protégés of Bandler Van Van and Grindel. Cool. Van wow. and Grindel. So, there you yeah. go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so it's almost like a first generation kind of thing. That's so, so cool. cool. You started young. I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, and so I opened a private practice and, and I was kind of cruising down the road and I was feeling pretty accomplished with my life. And, um, and then uh, where everything took a turn was when I was on my way home from work one night and I was stopped at a, a red light and uh, a guy hit me <clears throat> going about 45 miles an hour mm. with no skid marks, no attempt at the brakes. I'm not sure he wasn't paying attention, but um, oh, had a seatbelt on, but my my head snapped back over the top of the headrest, and so I, I broke my neck and I, and some of my thoracic vertebrae and herniated a disc in my back. More importantly, I got a traumatic brain injury, and so um, it was a long recovery. That <clears throat> it was um, man, I would say at one point I was seeing thirty doctors a week. How many? Thirty. Um, thirty. 
Wow. I mean, neuropsych, psychiatrist, occupational therapist, speech therapy. I had to kind of learn to read POC again, um, cognitive rehab, pain management clinic. I and mean, it just, it was, it was a long duration. And it, it really changed the course of my career because I suddenly couldn't really function as, as a therapist. I mean, I, I, I would miss appointments and, and lock my keys in my car and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so I ended up resigning from the, um, from the residential treatment center and closing my practice. Wow. And um, it was about a, a two year recovery um, from that. And <clears throat> I remember being told that your brain is like a muscle. Right? And so you can work it out. And if you work it out, you'll get, I was told you'll get anything you're going to get back in a year and a half. After a year and a half, you're not going to get anything more. Oh. Right. So I, um, I, I said, well, so what does it look like? To work out your brain. And they said, well, you need to do something completely different than what you normally do. Wait, can I it ask was, you a question? Yeah. Did you recognize mm-hmm. um, some of the things that were happening to you? I mean, did you actually recognize that you were struggling with words or with, you know, cognitive thinking or processing mm-hmm. things? You, you knew that for yourself? Definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, the speech thing was, was huge. You know, or just not being able to put a sentence together. It was was yeah. Um, your but your brain could think it, but you couldn't verbalize it. Right. So what yeah, part I, of I that? Have, what part of the brain was it that was affected? That affects, you know, what you what happened to you. So it's, it the, it's pretty interesting because um, it was a closed head injury. So it wasn't like I split my head open. But um, you know, when your skull comes together in the middle and those bones kind of grow down, so it's actually kind of sharp on the inside of your skull right down the center right and so what the neurologist told me is that my my spinal he said your spine tried to pull your brain out through the hole in the back of your head basically wow, wow. and so when that happens you get an acceleration deceleration um injury so your the, the mass of your skull is not the same as the mass of your brain so your brain gets kind of ripped along that so my brain kind of tore here through mm-hmm. Um, I had huge pain in my eye. I'd get these headache or just focus on my eye and then all the way back. Wow. And for those who are listening and not watching, he pointed from the front of his forehead, basically to the back of his skull, right? Yeah. 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 And I, I, you know, I tore kind of through the sleep center too. So I, I think I, I was getting anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours of sleep a night wow. for a couple of years. Just that in of itself will drive you nuts. That'll I mean, drive you, yeah. yeah truly that, running on empty. There are people who die just from lack of sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, I know yeah, that. Yeah. And I know it'll drive you wackadoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, messes it wasn't, with your even brain. Just, mm-hmm. wasn't even just the lack of sleep, but when you're up, you know, however many hours in the middle of the night, every single night, and everyone else in the world is sleeping, um, it's, it, it's nuts. Yeah. It's different. It's a um, different experience, I'm sure. Yeah, and that had yeah. to have been frustrating, you know, being able to, or like wanting to communicate these thoughts and not being able to verbalize them. It's like, you're yeah. still intelligent and you still have all of this information that's stored yeah. and you have all of this experience, but you can't share it or communicate it. That would be very frustrating. I could see that. Yeah. Can yeah. you um, well, explain good. maybe a little bit how you handled that? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's actually has a big impact on the work I do today. So I mean, all of this made me who I am. I'm happy to talk a little bit about that process. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, in an instant, I lost 10 IQ points. I've been, wow. um, I had my IQ measured before because I was in the psychology field, right. And so, um, and but yeah, it instantly lost 10 IQ points. And the, the lucky thing that I, I feel really fortunate um, because I was measured at, at borderline genius intelligence before the accident, right? Right. And, and awesome. one of, so I had some, I had, I had some, some extra, brain cells yeah. to burn, I guess. Right? <laughs> but, but the other thing is that it's still a loss. So that was hard sometimes to work with because it's invisible, right? Um, just because I, because I, 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 like I said, I'm fortunate that I still have 
the capacity they had, but it's still a loss when you go from one level to another. Major, yeah. You had to go through a grieving so, phase, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, so long it's time, an emotional it's loss process. because it takes away a part of who you were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I see that. And then when you you thought you think about losing um, my career or whatever at that moment, having to resign from the residential treatment center, I, I you know, and some of the stuff that came to me a little bit over time because I didn't I didn't know what I didn't know about myself. And I can remember being in a, a staff meeting at the treatment center. And um, it was in a relatively small room and I could not pay attention to, to what people were saying because the buzzing from the fluorescent lights was so loud wow. and no one else heard it, right? But I heard it. And, and I, with the brain injury, one of the things that was crazy is, is how your, your perception changes. It makes, it makes really some things hypersensitive and other things are yeah. dulled. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, like I was saying, I, I'm from a family of 10, right? So there was always chaos going on. There's always kids and my parents and all that. I mean, <laughs> we'd get together for Thanksgiving and there'd be, I don't know how many people, all my cousins and everyone there. But I can remember after the accident, um, going down to my sister's house um, for dinner. And it was, you know, just probably the seven or eight kids and my parents and stuff. And I just kind of disappeared. Everyone's it was like, overstimulating. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they found me in my sister's broom closet. I was just literally, I just went in there, I closed the door, I sat there and I, because I could not take any more um, sound, people, movement. Stimulation. Like all yeah. All that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was just too much. Yeah. I'm, I'm similar. I've got a big family. I mean, I have seven children and 13 grandchildren, but <laughs> I came from a That's family awesome. of seven um, and, and grew up in Utah. I talked to your wife about it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I can certainly relate to sharing time and, and having a lot of family time. Uh, so yeah, th- yeah. did this lead you into uh, the dual career that you're now practicing? Can you tell us about your careers now and how you've combined what you're doing and what you're doing for people? Yes. Yeah. So it, it is related to kind of the dual career. So I, when I was told, you know, I needed to exercise my brain, I was, I was telling on the story, I went to the library and I got a book on computers and I started building them. And after a while, wow. I started selling them. Right. That was my therapy. Right. And so eventually I was able to go back into practice and I, I joined a practice. It was a big practice um, that focused on traumatic brain injury treatment. And so I, I did that for a number of years. And um, it was kind of like I, I knew the clients from the, the inside out because I had experienced it. I was working with families and people with brain injuries and I, I could genuinely relate to exactly what they were they were feeling and so that was super rewarding um and then around that time uh, managed care or mismanaged care however you want to call it was coming in right it's the late 90s early 2000s and i think that the huge insurance conglomerates figured out we're, you know they're looking for ways to save money right so you can't see a brain injury on a cat scan or an mri so that was an invitation for them to basically quit paying and and so we probably had a 11 practitioners maybe in that practice and over a three month period everybody went out of business except for me the psychiatrist and the neuropsych man and so i i was seeing the writing on the walls because we were all injured i mean i was on every insurance panel there is Mm -hmm. um so i saw the writing on the wall and i started just bringing my practice down and then because of what i did with the computers and stuff I had something to fall back on, ironically. So I started, um, I, I finished, I actually got an associate's degree um, in computer information systems and a couple, you know, Microsoft, uh, Cisco, and started working for HP. So I spent 18 years in the corporate world. And um, there you go. You got all sorts of experience yeah. in your belt. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see that belt. It's more like a championship, you know, the big belt yeah. that, right. it, yeah. that carries all of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it, that's I, a, that's a reason a to be books. proud, though, Paul. It's mm-hmm. a reason to feel accomplished mm-hmm. and that's and amazing. blessed and so many things. But I didn't mean to interrupt. You continue because oh. this is very interesting. Well, yeah, thank you. I, and I talk about feeling blessed. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I was alive right after that accident. Oh yeah. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's sobering, long. huh? You, you realize yeah, your mortality, yeah. 
everything's temporary and, and you need to just yeah. do everything you can to get the most out of this life. Don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, part of the, part of my process that I think might be interesting um, to your listeners is uh, I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with the ladder of accountability um, or the book, reframe your brand, your blame, mm -hmm. but it, it looks at, you know, everybody is victimized in life at times. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but whether you, are a victim or stay a victim. Whether you really stay in that you. victim mentality. It's yeah. up to you. Yeah. yeah. And so they have this, this graphic of a ladder and, you know, at the bottom, you've got self-blame and blame of others and you've got self-righteous, you know, blame. And, and you, you kind of work your way up from being a victim to being um, empowered, the whole idea of it. And, exactly. and they call it the letter of accountability, not that you're taking accountability for what happens to you, but you're taking accountability for um, whether you're going to stay stuck. Right. Whether and, you're going to live in it or whether you're going to move beyond it and let it go. Mm -hmm. It's all part yeah. of the healing and moving forward. You're right. You're right about that. Yeah. And, and so that was a big part of my process because for a long time, I was looking, I was, I was asking the question, why, like, why did this happen to me? You know, why did God do this to me? Why didn't I, um, why did I stay late and do my case notes? Why didn't I drive them another way? All of that kind of stuff. And I, I really believed that there was some sort of mystical, magical answer, right? That I was going to get to that one. And I've come to believe now in my practice that, that in a, most instances, other than a six-year-old and asking why does uh, ladybugs have spots and why do butterflies fly, right? But in most instances in life, why is not a very helpful question because it, it keeps us stuck in either the past or the present, right? So why did I do this? Why did this happen to me? Right. Why am I so stupid? Why can't I blah, blah, blah? It's, and so the shift needs to go to what or how, right? And I, I teach my clients this a lot. You know, you need to go from why to what, like, what am I going to do next? Right. How can I work through this? How do I um, continue? How do I move moving? forward? How do I, you know, make a better life from, from this point on or, yeah. Yeah. Or how do I self-empower, right? Being right. able to let go, heal, move on and, and take forward the only the only the benefit that you can get yeah. from it. And and it's I always tell my clients, you know, the same thing working in the same field that the most painful lessons or the most painful events in this life are the most powerful lessons. Mm -hmm. We're not going to learn yeah. if we don't hurt. We're just not right. going to learn. There's no reason for us to have movement or, you know, right. to have growth if we're content and everything's, you know, peaceful and happy and hunky dory. Yeah. So, so it's, you're right. I about think you that. never know what a, a, a given event means at that moment. But right. I mean, my, my brain injury has had a major impact on my life and it was very painful, but there are also some blessings. And I, can, can you tell us some of the blessings? Um, Just a couple. Yeah. Of that come to mind? I, I mean, a, a big part of it really is about um, compassion and empathy. I mean, I was always kind of naturally compassionate, but when I work with my clients, I just have a, a lot of empathy. And, and I, I tell my clients, I, I genuinely feel really honored to work with people and to be part of their journey. I feel like our journeys in life are, are, are a, a sacred thing. And for me, being part of someone's journey, even in hard times like being a therapist uh, that's an honor to me right. and um so so that was one and then I guess the other thing is that that whole thing moved me a different on a different path um, it changed your life back yeah, yeah. Um, well you came back with so much more you know so many more layers and so much more diversity and so much more a deeper understanding of of experiences in life that you were able to use those to benefit others and that's that's the difference between uh, a victim mentality and and somebody who takes everything that they've experienced and turns it into the greatest thing that they can and and that's yeah. a good thing you know looking at you we really appreciate that you've done that yeah mm -hmm. yeah so do you want to explain uh i'm sorry do you want to okay. explain the different diversity in your because i know you have two different careers now yeah. Well, yeah. So um, before we, I don't know. Sorry no, for taking No, you're back, totally but fine. The thing I want to say too is that that process of moving from why to what and how, I know the exact moment that happened for me. And it was a poignant moment in my life that I'll always remember. 
Okay. So I was, I was probably a year and a half out from my injury. And I'd lived in Fort Collins, Colorado is where I lived at the time. I'd probably lived there nine, nine or 10 years. So I knew my way around. I was maybe a mile or two from my house. And I was driving home and I couldn't remember where I lived. I couldn't remember how to get home. Mm. Um, and so I started to kind of panic. And I thought, well, I'll just pull into a 7-Eleven because back, you know, no cell phones. Yeah. Right? I was going to pull into a 7-Eleven and, and call my wife she could come and get me and then I realized that I couldn't remember my home phone number wow and so I just pulled over on the side of the road and um and cried right I just sat on the side of the road and cried and prior to the injury I had really really enjoyed music I, my life was always a lot about music and after the brain injury because of the stimulation stuff I just couldn't but I was a year and a half later I was starting to listen to music again and so I had the radio on in the car and um, the Beatles came on um, the song, Let It Be. Mm -hmm. I had Paul McCartney singing about a, a dream that he had of his mother, where she came in and, you know, was Mother Mary, you know, whispers words of wisdom, let it be. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm there crying, tears running down my face. I'm listening to this song, which I always, I've always been a huge Beatle fan. And I, I something changed right? and, and in that moment. I somehow figured out, um, number one, that I'm, I'm just a guy with a brain injury, right? Nothing more, nothing left, less. I'm just a guy with a brain injury. It's part of who I am. So at that moment, something kind of integrated in. And that's also when I thought I need to quit asking why, right? What I need to ask is how am I going to get through this? What do I need to do to be my best, right? So this huge transformation happened that moment in that car. I just got yeah. chills. Me too. I was just going to say that. That was a yeah. message if I've ever heard one. I got that. It, Let it be. Go it ahead. It was. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a great memory because of my brain injury, but I remember that moment always. Yeah. Um, wow. So it was a big turning point. And, 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 and now I teach people about the ladder of accountability that I was talking about a moment ago. And there's a point in that graphic, if you look, at, look it up on the internet or whatever, where you kind of go from being a victim to starting to find meaning and and um, and that's the moment of that I went from one wrong to back. That's so, interesting too to actually experience the feeling of moving from one rung to the other because that's a level that you actually felt yourself lifted on that 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 was that must have been very impactful. And, yeah, I, and, and I wasn't aware of of that. I don't even know if at, at that point in time, I don't even know if that ladder of accountability had even been conceived of or published. It's only, you know, in, in recent years, I've come across that and went, wow, that was, my, that was me. Right. You know? And that's a great metaphor too, just for people going through stuff and especially something traumatic, even just from personal experience. Like if I'm at the bottom of the ladder, like I want to get up here and it just seems like, why? Like I am stuck down here. But whenever people realize that even just that little baby step up is getting you closer and closer, like to the healing that you're searching for. And, um, I just think that's another great reminder just to kind of take things one step at a time and not be so hard on yourself. Trust and, the process. Yeah. And just let it be. And like you yeah. said, not why, but how, you know, how yeah. do I, how do I handle this? How do I live with this? How do I accept it? And how do I move forward and become, you know, still the best version of myself that I can be with, with all encompassing with everything that has taken place, I can still become something much greater. And we do learn so much that, you know, I'm sure that your ability to, to have empathy and understanding with the, with the clients that you work with has expanded, mm -hmm. you know, it just, mm -hmm. you know, like exponentially, you just expanded your ability to be able to relate and even come up with answers with what their needs are. Because when you look at them, you can put yourself in that situation and see what would have helped you or what did help you. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe if someone who's listening is in the beginning stages of something similar to what you went through, what do you think a good starting place for them would be is maybe just whenever they start catching themselves questioning why to try to replace it with another how or what question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of an NLP type of thing, right? Or, or, or even with hypnotherapy, right? Language mm -hmm. is so important. 
And I, mm -hmm. there are a lot of my clients who I talk to about why and try and mm -hmm. but, right? There are those certain words that are very powerful words for good or bad. Well, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I talk to a lot of my clients about, you know, catch yourself on the why question and determine whether or not that's really um, going to be beneficial for, yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there's, um, I don't remember the guy's name, but he, you know, there's a thing about a book, I think, of you know, finding your why. And, oh, yeah. You know, and, 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 and so just to be clear, well, I think even Tony Robbins it. says that, you know, find your why. But, but yeah. he also says you have to get uncomfortable enough to move, to push yourself. You have to be that miserable to push yourself forward and get out of the state you're in. But I get what you're I think saying. That, I, yeah. that usage of why is really finding your finding your potential, finding your meaning, finding your purpose. Right. So I don't think you have to use the word why in that case. But right. So I guess our next question here would be: um, How often do you use hypnosis with your clients um, versus other modalities, or do you have a specific style that you like to use? Well, I, you know, I, I use a lot of different modalities. I do talk therapy. I do um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I'm a, primarily a solution-focused therapist. But I would say that at any given point in time, probably 70 or even higher percent of my clients are doing hypnotherapy with us at some point or another. Awesome. And the reason why is because um, it's just so efficient and effective and it, and it reaches um, a different part of the brain so there's a communication yeah. yeah that takes place and and i know you've got a couple of things going on here with your business so we don't want to necessarily you don't have to stay on hypnosis even though this is a, some of it's about hypnosis because this is about all healing modalities and every way that we can, you know, reach our potential and every way that we can expand our ability to accept and move forward and let go and heal and all those things. So, so whatever you want to share as far as how you use your skills and your talents and your schooling and what you've developed is what we want you to share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I do, there are times for talk therapy and, and, but, but again, even talk therapy, you know, isn't always effective, right. And I, and I, I can't tell you how many times, one of the, one of the questions I always ask when a new client comes in is, you know, have you had therapy before? Um, has it, you know, what did you like about it? What worked, what didn't work, all that kind of stuff. And there's still a lot of people who come in and say, well, yeah, I had this therapist and he was a nice guy and he always listened to me and he was like a shoulder to cry on. And, you, you know, I could always talk through stuff with them. And I say, yeah, but what, so what's changed? And they go, well, nothing. Like, there you so go. for me, the, the movement, definition of therapy the movement has forward, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if it's not change, it's not therapy. Right. right? right. So there are a lot of ways to intervene. And I, I, like I said, I use CBT, I use, a lot of so, different so approaches. define CBT for whoever our listeners are. Oh yeah. <laughs> so 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 CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, and it, it comes out of the idea that we always we have thoughts, then we have feelings, then we have behaviors, and we, we've suspected that for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. True, but we can prove it now, right? We've got the technology now to hook electrodes up to brains and to slow them down enough that we can see what part of the brain is lighting up. And, and it goes that way all the time. People don't always feel like that. I might say, what were you thinking before you know you got really angry? And they'll say, well, I wasn't thinking anything. It's like, no, you were. Because we saw it. <laughs> right? But it was probably habitual. And so you just thought in this habitual way, right? And, I, I, uh, and so a lot of CBT is about it is about identifying your thoughts and whether they're useful or helpful or not. It's not about whether they're right or wrong, whether they're good or bad, true or false. It's about right. does this work? Right. right. Is and it contributing to the benefit of your life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have depressogenic thoughts, right, where you're thinking depressed or, or anxiety, I work with a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. People, I found that people who are anxious tend to live in the future. Um, people who are depressed often live in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And um, those thoughts, you can change them. And, and a lot of people, clients that I see, they don't, it's a new idea to them. 
that you can choose what you think or don't. Yeah, and the NLP is really cool because when you can create an immediate brain switch and get out of the left brain, which is the future or the past, and come into the present, you can feel the switch. You can let go of those feelings of fear and anxiety or you know, regret or sadness, you know, whether you're dealing with the future or the past. And I, and I actually talk to my clients about that. I'm not a therapist, but I, but I do talk to my clients because it's really beneficial with the, you know, hypnosis and NLP and changing it, you know, where you're at and how you're handling what's happening in your life. Yeah. 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 And so you can do a lot with changing your thoughts and, you know, what's kind of become a theme for my therapy over time is the whole notion of um, intention. Like, like we go through life and there's an, I think it was, I it might've been Milton Erickson. I'm not sure. I think it was Milton Erickson who said it, you know, in order to get someone into a trance, first you need to get them out of the trance they're in. It might've been Bandler too, or one of those, but anyway, <laughs> it's very real, right? We go through life in a trance where we're, we're like a, a stick in a stream and we go wherever the flow is. And we, we sold ourselves this delusion that we don't have any control over that. And right. we do every moment of every day. We decide what we think. And if we change our thinking, we change our feeling. Our feelings, right? Change our behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And so you take that CBT and you combine that with hypnotherapy, and it's kind of like you're you're dealing with the left brain. You're just CBT. You're dealing with the right brain. You bring those together. You're using both sides of your brain, and and you get a lot of improvement in a short period of time yeah an expanded wow. concept of what's really going on and and a change of perspective and you, you're so smart paul we're so glad to have you on yeah, our we're podcast. so thankful how smart as i used to be i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> but yet you're still smart Not very much <laughs> but yet you're still smarter than a lot you know yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, there's people without any traumatic brain injury that can't keep up. So you're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. So can you tell us um, what you find the most rewarding? Um, is it just seeing the yeah. clients uh, so, improve? And Well, it is, but there is more than that. I mean, I have different things that I do. Um, and um I think you alluded to it earlier that I earlier that I have different I had different career paths. I didn't go down this path, but I I uh, after the the brain injury and getting into computers and stuff, um, I was in the corporate world for about eighteen years, and long I time. was yeah, it was a long time, and I was um, I ended up being the director and VP um, of a multi billion dollar corporation, and and so that taught me all kinds of different kinds of skills. But the reason I was ended up being a VP pretty quickly is because I, I wasn't the, the best technician or uh, technology guy. I mean, there's a bunch of people who are way sharper at that stuff than me, but I had the people side of things, right? I knew how to build a team. I knew how to build trust. All of my therapy stuff, skills came into the corporate world. And so I moved very quickly into that role. And then, when I left that role, you know, I don't know, it's been maybe four years, four or five years ago now, but I, I resigned that position because it wasn't my calling, right? There was no question that my calling was being a therapist. And, and the company I worked for was a develop a land development company. And so we, we always talked about legacies. We built these amazing places. If you ever come to Denver, um, you go to Denver Union Station, Right, that's a building that we completely revamped. Um, there's wow, a place in downtown awesome. called um, Dairy Block. Right, if, if you go to these places, they're places for people to gather, and they're they're pretty remarkable. And so, I have that that legacy. But what I realized is that wasn't really the legacy I wanted. I, I wanted the legacy as, as a therapist, and especially as a family therapist. If I'm working with parents or kids or couple or even individuals, and I can help them make a few shifts in their life great great grandchildren that I'll never meet or know will benefit from that ben right? exactly because I love that it does pass through the generations and that's where we need to realize that you know nothing just stops right here right when, when yeah. we're helping others yeah that's neat if, if, if I help someone um break an abuse cycle how many people down the line from them, kids, grandkids, great grandkids are going to benefit from that? Mm -hmm. but to me, that's the legacy. 
right? Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm when, I, when I'm dead and gone and cremated or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. That's the part that's, of me that's, that's your mortality left. living on, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that amazing. So amazing. And it's <laughs> sorry, it's just interesting too because. Not a lot of people think about that whenever, you know, you take control of your thoughts and your emotions. It's not just making your life better. It's helping those around you Mm -hmm. generally, generationally, even generationally. It's not just, (laughs) just, yeah, right. It's not just the immediate change, but Mm -hmm. it, but you pass everything down. We're all products of where we came from. And when we can change and make changes, we show our our children or our grandchildren that we can be empowered, that we can be different, uh, you know, and become a better you and that we can be in control or in charge of our life. We don't have to just give in to whatever the circumstances are. So that's pretty neat. Absolutely. Um, so how do you see COVID impacting mental health or mental health field now and in the future? Um, well, I mean, the, the obvious thing is kind of the move toward, um, telehealth, right? There's more of that. Um, as a licensed therapist, that it puts me in a, a bind that I don't like. It, you know, I, I mean, I appreciate being licensed, but I'm only licensed in Colorado. So even though I can do teletherapy all over the country, I can't do therapy in the, if, if my client is in another state. So I yeah, think that's interesting, things, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah if I, ironically, if I wasn't licensed, I could do it all over the country, but as well, my license, though being certified in hypnosis, it's a little bit easier for you to do it in the framework of hypnosis, right? It is. I can, um, I can do some coaching people kind of with hypnosis as part of that. But, but the thing I have to be careful about is, is basically the way it's laid out. If you're licensed, anything you do falls under that license. I got gotcha, you. No matter yeah. what you Call it. Like I'm not a licensed therapist, so I can do hypnosis anywhere as long as I stay within the guidelines and keep my verbiage and, you know, my intention yeah. and my, yeah, even though they really do cross paths a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes it almost easier for me not to be, you know, a licensed therapist. I can see how that could bring a challenge on how, how are you dealing with that? What are you doing for that? Well, I mean, I, basically, I'm waiting for things to change. How to fix? It, right. I mean, yeah. I think it'll be hard because it has to happen on a state by state basis. But I think, other than California, everybody passes a national exam. I passed mm-hmm. that national exam twice when I went out of the corporate world back in. I had to relicense. And if it's a national exam, like why can I only practice? Why can you not it practice nationally? Patients, yeah. Right? I think it has more to do. I don't want to be controversial, but I think it might have more to do with money, you know, because people, they license you in their state, they collect things, they hold you accountable. And yeah, right. so that's a shame, yeah. but, but I hope that things can change for you. Yeah. What the the you biggest, have? the biggest COVID change though, is to me is um, anxiety and depression. I, I used to have people come in and maybe I diagnose with anxiety, maybe I diagnose with depression. These days, it's almost a given. Like people who come into my office, it's just anxiety abounds. Uh And I think that's from COVID. Fears of the future. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know it also has affected um, children so much because it's changing the whole uh, ability to communicate, to read expression, Mm -hmm. to, to notice, you know, to connect and be able to develop empathy and compassion and and read faces and you know everybody thinks that and that's that's the negative about you know technology and and all these social media sites is they everybody represents themselves as being so happy and so successful and everything's perfect and you're not seeing the real life you're not experiencing you know compassion or or confusion or all of the things that we go through and so it keeps people more isolated which you know we could go into a whole different story with that, but, um, but that's the shame. And that's the thing. That's some of the things we don't know what the results are going to be. Isn't it? Do you think? Yeah. I, yeah, I think we, we don't, I, I think we're going to see them. They're going to become apparent, you know, but right now we don't know. all. Of them. And we were but. talking about that a little bit before we hopped on this call about, you know, we really won't truly see all of the effects of this until further down the line. 
But when you think about how depression in the past is, you know, people living in the past, and I think about the kids that have missed their prom and, you know, everything because of the pandemic, and then they're going off into, you know, the workforce with uncertainty and fear of the future with the pandemic. So I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety and depression, you know, that could be a result of this right. in the future. And the development, you know, mm -hmm. when you've got the young children being forced to wear masks and stuff and they, they don't, they don't know how to read people. They're not learning social cues. Right. Yeah. yeah. So do you, well, do the, you, the schooling uh, stuff impacts even way later. I, did, I didn't mention this before. One of the things when you asked about, um, you know, what do I find so rewarding? I, I also am a clinical supervisor. So I, I'm a, a graduate instructor and a clinical supervisor for Colorado State University. Wow. Right? And so, um, but I've, we've graduated several classes, with no graduation ceremony, mm -hmm. right? So we're on a Zoom or a phone call. And these are people who, you know, devoted a, a ridiculous amount of work to, to earn an, a, an advanced degree. And, and they don't get no... to feel the reward of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, and the other... they can know within themselves, but that's, that takes a talent too, doesn't it? Yeah. And the, and the other thing is the program that I, that I um, work with and actually I came out of at CSU is well known because it does, it provides a lot, way more than is required um, live behind the mirror clinical supervision. So I might be behind the one way mirror and I might have five different sessions going on therapists, you know, on the other sides of those mirrors. And I, we case plan together and then they come back and we check in all that kind of stuff. It's an extremely dynamic way to learn. And it's kind of paramount to, to a lot of these training programs. When you, when you can't do that, um, a lot of what people hope to get in coming into a specific program um, and you can't provide that. It's hard too. You're not yeah. getting that hands-on experience, you know, because there's yeah. even energy that passes between people when mm -hmm. you're communicating your feelings or your circumstances or, you know, whatever you're struggling with. There's an energy that you can feel because I depend on that energy and my instincts mm -hmm. as well. And those are not being developed, like you said. Yeah. Right. yeah. Sure is interesting. So tell us um, what your future holds. What what are you going to do that you know that you can do, and what are you going to work towards? Good question. Mm -hmm. So um, I, there are a few things that are interesting. Sometimes things fall into your path, right, and you don't even necessarily intend for that to happen. Um, what I've been doing a lot more lately is actually working with people around physical um, things. So I've I've had a number of doctors refer to me. For things like um, POTS, which is uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia, it's you know when you sit up or they stand up, their their heart rate will shoot 100, 160, and they'll sometimes go into convulsions or have seizures. And um, anyway, I, I that and other other physical things. But I had a a, a dad of an 18 year old girl called me and said, "Hey, my daughter has POTS. We've gone to all of these specialists. We've gone out of state." And there's just nothing that can help her. And, and her her symptoms were she was she was vomiting five or six times a day every day. She had pain in her stomach that she um, on average was an eight out of ten, and she wasn't sleeping more than an hour and a half a night because of the pain and this other stuff. And he said, "Can you help her?" And I was like, "You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't make any promises, but let me look but I'm into it." Try. Right? Yeah. So I started, <laughs> I started researching this and we agreed to have her come in because he didn't, he was tight on money. He spent a lot of money on, on, on trying to problem. find I'm answers. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we did three sessions and I did one session um, for anxiety. So, so here's where I, I came to thought people with these kinds of disorders um, often they have the sympathetic nervous system is just vibrating at a high level all the time. Right, anxiety or fear or whatever it is, they're just constantly up there. Your, your body can't do that forever. And so that was kind of my hypothesis. And so I did one session just on um, anxiety, a hypnotherapy session on anxiety and on bringing down that sympathetic nervous system out of the fight or flight and down into the rest and relax. And then I did a session um, for insomnia and I did a session for pain management. And I followed up with her two months later and um, she had literally not thrown up once 
wow. our first session. Isn't that exciting when those ha those things? I happen? love that. <laughs> you talk about rewarding, right? Yeah. I asked her what's your what's your pain like average, and she said a three. Wow. And I That's said, huge. how are you sleeping? She said, I'm sleeping seven eight hours a night. Right? That's awesome. Wow. That so is the reward in what and in, in this kind of work, because there yeah. people. It can be something that seems so minute to to an outsider but inside of them to be able to calm their heart or to be able to uh, find a better future or to be able to believe in something different than you know what has been controlling them and feel that release is life altering you know and i have people you know and i know i didn't save anybody's lives but i have people tell me you know you changed my life or you helped me to change my life it's just like it's so rewarding yeah. isn't it <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's huge. And so somehow my name kind of got out there and um, I started to get referrals in. So I've had a bunch of clients with POTS, um, um, functional neurological disorder, um, chronic fatigue, those kinds of things that are sort of an anomaly a lot of times for Western medicine in terms of being able to help. And I'm finding the hypnotherapy and NLP and literally just helping <laughs> people bring this down is having huge impact. Impact, wow. yeah. I love that. I mean, I have a, a, a girl I've been working with recently. She's a um, middle school girl. And, and I don't know if you're familiar with functional neurological disorder, but it's she um, had kind of a traumatic event where, where um, she almost got hit by a car and she, she would relive that. But it, it, she was already up here and that pushed her over the edge. And so she started having these huge tits couldn't walk she couldn't I mean her the huge her whole body would, it was like a mobile above a, everything a affected her yeah couldn't go to school um it, it was just and when she walked in her parents one on each side walked her into the office because she couldn't stand on her own and she had this huge um startle response if you made even a small sound they would like tip the whole mm. mobile and I've been it's working crippling. with her it, it's crippling when those things take effect and you mm -hmm. can't and you don't have a any tools to to figure out how to get out of it huh yeah but she actually i mean she's back in school now she um she wrestles for her school she's winning actually winning tournaments wow, wow that's tournaments awesome her whole life i mean she's come a long long way and that's again amazing. i can't you know i'm not a i'm not a physician i can't say that i cured her or anything cured her, but I certainly right. she, i helped her improve her quality of life drastically Right. And everything's interconnected. We know that the mind and the body is all connected. So, you know, when somebody has a issue like a, a foot that won't heal or a back pain or a neck pain or, you know, stomach situations, it's because we may be carrying something in the gut. We may be guilty or we may carry the weight of the world on our shoulders or we may we may not can move forward. So, you know, our legs not healing or whatever it is. It, it's really in, interesting how it's all interconnected. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're doing great so when work. I talk about moving forward, oh, thank you. <laughs> when I think about moving forward, um, I want to be doing more of that because it's so rewarding. I mean, you talk about instant gratification or nearly instant gratification. Yeah, you know? that's amazing. Um, that's then the other thing in terms of moving forward is um, uh, that I'm doing more of and, and actually working for doing more in the future is um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Oh yeah. Nice. Well, you're in Colorado, well, Mushroom yeah. City. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, it's it's been decriminalized in Denver, but still not legal. But ketamine is, right. is I do um, ketamine assisted therapy. Really? And it's yeah. Hey, it's, can it's you a, can you explain a little bit about how that helps? You know, assist. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Um, the use case for it is treatment resistant depression or and or anxiety and, and it seems to be even more helpful with people who have a traumatic past right. so the, the way i started getting into this i was working with a client for a number of years and and she was just constantly depressed and we with hypnotherapy she made great strides but she never quite got to the point where she would say i'm not depressed had that break so yeah yeah. And so what, what you do is there's two models of ketamine therapy, one that I sort of am not too hip on, and then there's another one. In, in Colorado, at least, 
and you can go to Fort Collins and there's a place where you go in and they actually hook you up to IVs with ketamine really? um, for like an hour and a half and they monitor you, but they don't do therapy. You. right they just, they, just they let you go through the process i because i have some close friends or you know a couple of children <laughs> that's experienced yeah. what you know the uh what is it what is the other name for the kind of the frog poison oh i know what you're talking about i don't know what the name dmt is, or something dmt yeah. or something like that is because there's supposed to be a breakthrough and a spiritual and emotional but it puts you in a heightened state where you're able to break through and there have been some people you know i don't know anything about it i'm not you know encouraging it or or discouraging it uh, you know you need to do what's right for you and and do a lot of research but um but i have seen some people respond and and get over addiction or things that they could not find a way to get past so i was wondering in the relationship how does ketamine affect the mind yeah, so th this is the interesting part, right? So I don't do the whole hook some up to an IV thing. What I do is low dose ketamine that you can get in the lozenge. I actually do therapy with the person while they're under the influence. Wow. And the best thing that I can think of in terms of making, helping understand it is as, as a hypnotherapist, right? As, as you guys know, um, you spend a lot of time sort of in one way communication, because if you're asking for too much stuff from your client, every time you ask them a question, they're going to go to their conscious mind, get the answer, right. and then they're going to, it's harder to keep them in trance, right? So right. you're constantly kind of maintaining a trance. What I find with the ketamine is that the ketamine sort of manages the trance for you. So you don't have to constantly be working on that. Right. You don't have and to induce so, it. They just kind of right. are in that state from, okay. Yeah, and it, and it hits really fast and it wears off really fast. So they might take the lozenge and within five minutes, right, they're, they're um, in that sort of trance state. And then you can have this really dynamic back and forth. And they tend to have, um, they tend to have uh, insights that they didn't have before. They, wow. It's easier for them to approach trauma, right? Because that ketamine gives them a little bit of a, of a buffer. Yeah, um, it makes them brave. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's funny because it's one client I was talking about before. I, there were certain elements that I kind of tried to get her to see differently, you know, or insights for quite a long time. We brought it up several times and it just didn't seem to ever like click. And get a in our first yeah. ketamine session, about halfway through, she goes, you know what I just realized, blah, blah, blah. And I went, awesome. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it's wow, there how that's you get there, but, but, and so is yeah. ketamine, is it, is it, it is it against the law or can you do this? Um, okay. So you can do it yeah. in Colorado, but maybe in other States it may, it, do you know anything about that as far as the legality? I know, I know that. So several of these medications, so um, psilocybin, ketamine, MDMA are all on a, on fast track for um, the FDA because people are realizing how critical these, these treatments can be. So I don't know, I'm assuming ketamine is, you can do it in any state. I don't think Colorado's particular, right. but you have to have a, a prescription. Right. And you'd probably and then, have to be a PhD or a licensed therapist or something to be able to, to use that, wouldn't you? Because I mean, obviously I, as a hypnotist, I wouldn't be able to offer that. Maybe they could get on it themselves and I could work with them. But yeah, because yeah, then another thing that people do is they'll do like, um, a, they'll do the ketamine themselves. And then in between ketamine sessions, they might come in for a psychotherapy session so that you're integrating their experiences. So, and, you know, and they're coming to you like they would normally come to you. They're not. Right. Um, so we're not crossing any so, lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. The other, the other thing I've found really useful is, a, you know, if you do some research, but when people come out of ketamine, just like they're when they're coming out of a deep trance, they tend to be suggestible period of afterwards and so I'll have my clients um like I said it hits really fast and it comes off really fast I'll have my clients tell me when it starts to wear off let me know and they'll say it's starting to wear off and then I'll switch gears and I'll go into a hypnotherapy session I take whatever we because because inevitably some magical stuff happened right during that session right I take that stuff switch to hypnotherapy mode and then do a hypnotherapy brief the hypnotherapy session to kind of set all that stuff in 
Right. And you can reinforce it and you can give suggestions that that are going to plant in, in deeper on that deeper level and be able to influence them to see and feel what they need to see and feel or, yeah. you know, what they don't need to see and feel. I've always heard the definition mm -hmm. of, of um, why people come to see us, you know, as far as hypnosis and neuro linguistic programmers and coaches is because they either cannot do something that they want to do or achieve or they can't stop doing something that they don't want to continue right is that is that yeah. am i saying that I, right i think so I, david schneider um has something that he says all the time that's that is right? something you want more of or something you want a whole lot less of there's i think right. what he says. oh i like that <laughs> simplified yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that's awesome and i mentioned earlier that i i really feel honored to be part of people's journeys. And I think a big part of that is because it's hard and scary to change, right? It, and, and when people walk through my door, I have a lot of respect for them that they had the, the ability courage. and the yeah. courage to come do it, especially men. You know, I mean, I mean, you get a lot more women dragging men into therapy than you do men dragging mm -hmm. women. And, yeah, and, and right. depending on your ethnicity- it, it, it does take a- it does take courage to admit, you know, yeah. you have to kind of lower that pride and, and say, you know what? And, and you know what I always tell my clients is for anybody to think that they don't need to change or grow or, or better themselves or, or get over things or change their perspective. They're almost arrogant and ignorant to think that, mm. you know, a world that had who knows how many years before them and how many years after them to think that they know all and have all, and they don't need this, you know, it's kind of an arrogance because it yeah. takes a lot more intelligence and it takes a lot more humility and it takes a lot more you know, ability to adapt and change to be able to say, I want to be the best I can be. And, and if you can help me, uh, you know, I yeah. want you to help me. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to yeah. ask for help sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. It is. I think one of the most ironic things that I hear is sometimes I'll have, um, sometimes I'll have guys come in or, or someone talking about, I'd like for my brother to come. I'd like for my husband to come in, but I know they never will. Right. Because um, they see therapy, you know, if you have, if you go to a therapist that you must be weak, right. I'm thinking, are, are you serious? Cause I'm thinking the exact opposite. Strong. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And strength. True. Right. And so like, to me, if, if you can't sort of get the courage to go to therapy, that sounds more like a weakness to me. Then you're going to be going. stuck. You're not going to be able to grow and improve. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a stigma that should definitely be broken because everybody could benefit from yeah. working on We themselves. need each other yeah. too. I, I ask Suzanne for help all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I guess um, since we're cutting it close on time here, I think that uh, we should wrap up with a little segment that we like to do uh, where we just okay. ask you some quick fun facts so our listeners can get to know you a little bit better on a different level um right. so uh do you consider yourself an early bird or a night owl now that you I, have your sleeping patterns better <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely naturally a night owl night owl most yeah. people say that actually i'm an early bird it's not necessarily <laughs> beneficial to though you right. know being getting up early and i've and i've watched a lot of podcasts and learned a lot about your is it circadian clock they call it yeah where you know you wake yeah. up with the sun yeah and you get your brain stimulated and moving and and you close your eyes at night and and get plenty of rest and it balances your body but i yeah i'm a night owl too so <laughs> uh do you know your zodiac sign yeah i'm a taurus oh awesome <laughs> yeah uh let's see what is the one song that gets you hyped up no matter when or where let it be. All right. I'm gonna have to, it's not let it be. Although I, 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 that's certainly a very meaningful song to me, but yes. not necessarily if you're getting hyped up. For me, it's um, probably hooked on a feeling. Oh, that's good. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I can remember being in high school and we used to make mixed tapes, right? Right. And I always had hooked Cassettes. on a feeling. We got to talk, we got to talk on the beginning, you know, it just always like get to go on. That's the jam. <laughs> that's the jam. That's, that's another thing David Snyder does. If you've been to his any of his things, he always starts off 
And by the time that song is done, everyone's hyped and ready to go. So we did speak a little bit about this, but just the first thing that pops in your head, what lights you up and excites you the most in life right now? The most in life. Wow. That's a big question. Um, probably, oh man, there's so many areas. Probably watching my children um, become themselves, right? So my, my, my oldest daughter is uh, 37 and she's uh, a social worker. Um, she was working with the city and county of Denver in child welfare and that's hard work. Wow. And she always felt not very... Like she didn't have much control of the system. And so she always wanted to be more of a policymaker or have something to do with writing policy. And so she, um, last year, she actually went from the city to the, the state of Colorado and she's in charge of implementing that new um, federal mandate that for prevention of child services. So instead of having, waiting till the kids are in trouble and then putting them in a foster home, right? Prevention. So she's doing that. She's uh-huh. loving that. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. And I've been, and, and youngest daughter, she runs a whole gamut. I've got an, I've got a, uh, we have one son who's uh, retired military and he's got a couple of kids. So we got the grandkids there, there in Utah. Um, oh, cool. And then that's where um, I was born, one, you know, oh, I was, was born it? in Utah. Okay. Yeah. I talked to your uh, wife I, about it. My dad was at Hill Air Force Base and, and we, there was a job offer in Florida and that's how we ended up here. He came to Eglin Air Force Base, but it was civil service. He was uh, he wasn't you know military, but so I grew that's, up there. That's I was born in kind of August. Does. Yeah, that's what our son does now. Is he's now a civilian doing a similar job? Oh, cool, uh, awesome. Uh, and then, ironically, our our middle daughter, who is not a biological daughter, but but one who I took legal guardianship of when she was uh, a young teen, um, that's just nice. graduated last year with her marriage and family therapy degree. Wow, he definitely Aww. followed in my footsteps. Oh yeah. So That's you amazing. are changing generation after generation. Yeah. That's so cool. It is. Yeah. So and proud of you. Youngest, oh, thank you. I'm <laughs> proud of them. It's so, it's so awesome to just see them come into their own. Right. And, and be not just like successful, right. But to, to be wise and to be kind and gentle and caring. Like if, I, would, I wouldn't be nearly as proud if I had a kid who was extremely successful but they weren't kind and gentle right and, exactly because that's right? what we need that's what the world needs right that's what the world needs yeah mm-hmm. you're doing a good job thanks well and i have to but i know we're short on time i have to make about my youngest too because she's just finishing up her clinical rotation yeah um, wow and how old is she she's 24 wow awesome. about the same age as me so she's she's gone from every five weeks she goes to a different state. she she's um really liking um ortho if she, she's okay oh, she's fine with blood she comes home she's like we were doing a knee surgery on this guy and had a massive blood went all over my ass it was so cool <laughs> <laughs> hey we need people she, like that because yeah. i am the opposite as long as she's oh, not yeah. like that dexter guy and just likes blood no, <laughs> no she just, now that's it, neat that's really neat she did her rotation her last rotation was emergency medicine and she's talking about well like i came in and he, he put his hand through the a table saw and I we sewed his fingers back on and this other guy and I'm like okay wow she I'm sounds amazing someone, I'm glad someone likes that right because yeah, I don't and we need yeah we need yeah. we need all everybody that, that we've all got a place in this life and to understand that we have something to offer is so important yeah. they're finding their yeah. place in life just like you said that's awesome I can relate to that too because I have seven kids and they're between the ages yeah. of 41 and my youngest just turned 26, the third of February. Okay. So, so, and I, you know, and I, it's weird because the older I get, the more, the only meaning that life has is that they are okay, that they are safe, that they are happy. If that's all I could get, yeah. I, you know, I don't have to have anything else that brings me so much peace and so much joy and, and happiness that, you know, that's, it's weird. The older I get, the more I can be satisfied with less. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, to that point, I think as you as you get older, hopefully things sort of get simpler. There's, there's a whole lot of games in life that you don't really need to play, Mm-mm. right? You start learning um, that the, the simplicity of 
you know, just being what you need to yeah. be and doing what you need to do. That's so cool. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we really want you to um, tell us about your business and everything, and I'm going to let her take over. Oh, yeah, we've got one more question for uh, the Fast Fun Facts. Oh, okay. Uh, if our listeners could walk away with one nugget of information from today's conversation, what would you want it to be? That's an easy one for me um, because it's evolved over time, and that, that's a whole notion of living with intent. Right? And I actually have a sign in my office that we found in a sports book that says, live less out of habit and more out of intent. There you it go. seems that. pretty simple, but that if people can get that, it's huge. Intentional in your relationships, intentional in the way you think, intentional on what you focus on, intentional about your health, whatever. What you say. You know? Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Huge. Repeat, repeat yeah. that again. So it's, um, it says live less out of habit and more out of intent. Live less out of mm-hmm. habit and more out of intent. Good job. Yeah, less less like a stick floating down the stream, and more like someone who's choosing. What You're actually think, paddling. What yeah. <laughs> yeah. Avoid the waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just great. amazed at how much we abdicate our ability and responsibility. It's like it's like we're I don't know where it comes in our culture. I really haven't taken time to think, but we sort of have this belief that that. Feelings just happen and thoughts just happen. There's nothing I can do about it. And everything yeah. and everybody Person. else is responsible for them instead of ourselves. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So and so makes me mad. So and so mm-hmm. makes me sad. It's like, how do you think about that? Is actually, you can have two people with the exact same circumstance, one who is devastated and one who gets over pretty quickly and moves on. It has everything to do with what they think, it doesn't have to do with what they encounter. Exactly. You know? Very smart. Words of wisdom, Paul. Yes, thank you so much. And if our yeah. listeners want to maybe work with you or reach out, what would be the best way for them to get some more information from you? Well, they can go to, so, so my business name is Cohesive Solutions and Solutions is spelled S-O-U-L. So cohesion, so, whether it's families or business. So I, I do quite a bit of executive leadership coaching because I bring in my corporate awesome. stuff and it, that name originally came out of um, the people are the soul of your business if you really want oh. a thriving business it's about the people there um, so anyway yeah so cohesive solutions.com with s-o-u-l um, or you can certainly give me a call um, or probably Tammy because I'm usually seeing clients she's answering the phone but um, that's 970 617 3640. Awesome. Okay. And yeah. we'll and we'll run it know, across the bottom of your our interview to you. We'll also put that information awesome. up to make sure. Yes. But we want you to share it. We want you to say it so that you know people hear it more than or see it more than once, you know. Yes. And and if you're on if you're more on the corporate coaching kind of side, there's I have a different website which is cohesive perfect. Say that one more time. Uh cohesivecoaching.com. There you go. Got it. That's awesome. more for like, you know, CEOs or, or entrepreneurs, business owners who are looking. Yeah. Um, to look in a step up, cool. step up their business, step their the game com- up communication mm-hmm. or relations or whatever it is. Yeah. Good job. I'll yeah, tell thank you, you so much. Oh, go yeah, ahead. I'm absolutely. Sorry. I was going to say, I'll tell you, you know, if you're a CEO, um, there's this whole idea of, you know, you don't mix business and, and personal if you're a CEO and you want the best business, it's going to get personal. You need to be talking about your own fears and the way you were raised and what your limiting beliefs are and all that kind of stuff. Because that's the things that will stand in the way of you progressing or being better, right? Yeah. It, and it's amazing. If you look at how, you know, families kind of evolve, you look at, you know, how they came down generation to generation and say, okay, see how this evolved. So with CEOs, it, their business will take on their problems, right? So if they haven't worked through some personal things, what's going to show up in their business going to be exactly. their personal stuff. Mm-hmm. Because that's what, that's what people do. They, they live how they feel. They live what they believe and they live what they're taught unless they find a way to, to get over that. Um, it and would really be cool. The head of that organization, that's going to, it'll flow through the entire organization. And there you go. Yeah, it would really, it would be cool to be able to maybe um, 
get you back on here sometime in the future. And if you have like a theme or even if any of our listeners has any specific questions that they think that they could benefit by communicating with you, we'll yeah, let us know. Yeah, we'll make sure yeah, we come. No, back. absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to come back on. This has been a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. And um, I know our listeners are going to just get so much value from today's conversation. So um, thank you so much again. And we'll definitely have to have that. Yeah. 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 All right. Good awesome. Job. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Rise and Shine It's Hypno Time podcast. If you found some value in this episode and enjoyed it, please consider liking, subscribing, and giving us a five-star review. Most people may not know that interacting with our content and our channel helps us to continue the work we're doing and reach more people. And we just want to thank you again from the bottom of our hearts for being such a loyal listener. And don't forget to tune in next week and every Tuesday for the latest episode of the Rise and Shine is Hypno Time podcast with Dina and Suzanne. See you next week.